welcome to another booktube video from me lauren from lauren and the books welcome back welcome back to me welcome back to you welcome back i took the majority of the month of june off um just as a little get your head back in the game type thing i think it's good to maybe take a break from these things and maybe gives me a chance to be a bit more creative and have a little think about some videos that I want to film going forward and yeah it sort of coincided with a break from the All About the Archers podcast I do too um, and coincided with some life stuff that was happening that was by chance but very useful um, so yeah so I've had a month off apart from a couple of videos I made for Independent uh, Bookshop Week uh, and here I am back back with an exciting video I mean this is an exciting video to make this probably it's up there in my top 10 videos to make of the year, but it's my best books of the year so far. So I make a best books of the year at the end of the year. I'm just watching Daphne because I think she's trying to eat these flowers over there. Daphne, no flowers. They make you go die. Good girl. Good girl. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be filming the, I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about the best books that I've read this year, which is exciting in itself. But may I just say, this is the first year I've done this. I've only got, so I, I work in tens, so I do my top ten of everything, my top ten best books of the year, whatever, but I have only been able to find eight books that I think are worthy of this list, because my reading just hasn't been as good as previous years. So the books that feature on this list, they're all great books, and other years, maybe they would have featured on my best books of the year, but apart from those eight books nothing else has really sung to me which is why this is not a 10 book list so i'm going to start at number eight and work my way up to number one number one is a bit of a surprise to me but i cannot deny that it is the best book that i've read this year but we'll start backwards and work upwards would love to hear down below if you've read any of these books what your favorite books of the year have been so far and yeah looking forward to getting into this and looking forward to being so the first book, number eight, is Brotherless Night by Vivi Ganeshanathan. Um, you might have uh, heard of this book because it recently won the Women's Prize for Fiction, which was lovely. That was the reason I read it, because it was on the long list and then on the short list. Um, and I very much enjoyed this book. Enjoyed is a hard word to use when describing this book because some really brutal and horrific stuff happens. But what this book did and why it sort of stayed with me is because it educated me on a period of time in my lifetime where there was a civil war going on in Sri Lanka that I just was not educated on and did not know was happening. So we're hearing about this war from um, a young woman's point of view who's training to be a doctor. Um, and the title of the book, Brotherless Night, relays to the fact that she is losing her brothers. She's got a series, uh, she's got a set of brothers, I think there's four brothers, um, and she, she's losing them during this civil war. Um, and while she's running this sort of, uh, while she's learning to be a doctor and trying to do the right thing in a environment where there's many things that are considered the wrong thing to do, and sort of looking trying to balance out her duty of care with the war and uh, atrocities that are going on around her like i said it really really educated me it really floored me like when i was reading it in bed like i had to keep stopping and being like oh my god this young woman i can't believe all the things she's having to put up with and the, the things that are going on around her and it was very sort of like in keeping with some awful stuff that's going on in the world at the moment as well um but yeah, I thought it was an amazing book and I'm so pleased it won the Women's Prize um, because this is the sort of book that I never ever would have picked up had it not been on one of those lists. So although I didn't love many books from the Women's Prize, I did love two. There's another one coming up later. Um, and yeah, like grateful for those prizes because then we get to see, get to read things that we, we ordinarily wouldn't do. So yes, Brotherless Night by V.V. Ganesha the Thumb. Next up is... The Golden Mole and Other Vanishing Treasure by Catherine Rundle with illustrations by Talia Baldwin. I'd seen this around a bit. I always thought it was a children's book when I'd seen it around. I think it came originally in like a bigger sort of hardback book. It's gorgeously produced. It's a non-fiction book um, about uh, animals that are uh, going um, extinct or near extinct and sort of like, or, or there's like, bad stuff happening to them um and some amazing facts about them and it just really reminded me of like reading non-fiction when i was younger about a specific thing and then all these facts just like filling my brain and sort of saying to david as i was reading i wasn't saying to david when i was younger but like 
reading this so for example about the giraffe I'm, I'm trying like and i'm recalling the facts as i'm looking at it so each little chapter starts with this gorgeous illustration of a giraffe and then a little bit about it um a, like sort of like giraffes appearing in history and um, a fact about it and the fact about the giraffe um was that when they bend down to drink um they have uh the blood vessel shuts off uh, allowing blood to their head so that they're not dizzy all the time when they when they bring their heads back up which I thought was very interesting but yeah loads and loads of amazing facts beautifully pulled together like honestly this is the most gorgeous thing ever like all of this gold foiling French flaps with these gorgeous illustrations and yeah just a lovely lovely thing so well researched and actually once I read it I'd, I'd never read anything by Catherine Rundle before um and I was like, oh God, this makes me want to read everything. So I've got a lot of her children's books out on audiobook at the moment on uh, Libby. So I'll be getting around to, to reading that. But yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Would make a beautiful gift. First one for the Christmas gift guide? Maybe. I mean, we're in the second half of the year now. I need to put the tree up. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely loved it. Beautiful. Really heavy, heavy, heavy book. And then next up is that second book from the Women's Prize for Fiction long list. This one didn't make the shortlist. It's Night Bloom by Peace Adzo Medi, um, which is a book that I also very much enjoyed from the long list and also probably wouldn't have read had it not appeared on the long list what i like about this and the reason just itch my leg the reason i think it sang to me is that it's got cousin representation in there so you'll know that me and my cousin are very good pals i feel like it's rare that you read about cousins in books so i was already sort of linked in with that anyway um this cousin's relationship's not like my cousin relationship because they sort of were very 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 close as children and then sort of came apart and then are coming back together um due to a sort of tragedy in their adulthood but i loved the sort of flow and the um the tell like the, the the way this was told because you hear like the first chapter is from one uh, the first half of the book literally like big chunk of the half of the book is told from one cousin's point of view and you literally think you understand everything from that bit and you're like oh that other cousin's not that nice i can't believe i'm i'm, I'm interested to hear about that sort of that from her point of view because you feel you feel like you know it all and then you go to and then the second half of the book is told from the other cousin's point of view and is amazing and also like really explains some of the stuff that's maybe glossed over a bit in the front uh, and the first bit and yeah really really well done and also the sort of pacing of the book whereas like they spend like three double pages talking about one particular meal and how that meal had been cooked and then they'd sort of go one double page and that would span sort of like seven years so I really liked that that sometimes feels a bit jarring for me but it just worked so well in this book but yeah really really enjoyed it it was sad not to see it on the on the um on the short list but yeah I thought it was great and again one that I wouldn't have read had I not seen it on the women's prize long list uh, next up was an audiobook um, I listened to, and that's A Slice of Fried Gold by Nick Frost. Um, I'm really smiling because it really did make me smile the whole time I was listening to this. David is listening to it at the moment. So Nick Frost is a comedian and actor from the UK. You might know him from films like, well, from the Cornetto trilogy. So Shaun of the Dead, um, Hot Fuzz and The World's End. But he's been in other stuff as well with Simon Pegg and, and, and without Simon Pegg. Um, and yeah, I was sort of aware of him and I'd heard him do it. So this book's been out a while now and I'd heard him on a few podcasts when the book came out originally and thought oh yeah that sounds like something that i would like to read at some point it's a memoir told through food um and includes recipes um so when i started listening to it when i saw that the audiobook of this was on um borrow box i was like oh i'll definitely get hold of this but, oh my god i absolutely cracked up throughout it's so so funny he really has a way a sort of turn of phrase and just a way of like really speaking to you and it's like you're just having a chat with your mate and they're telling you a really really funny story also it's one of those beautiful beautiful things where it doesn't feel like you're listening to an audiobook like I had this experience when I was listening to another um non-fiction audiobook from um from some comedians and that was the Gone Fishing um audiobook with from Paul Whitehouse and Bob Mortimer where it literally just feels like someone's sort of like coming out with these stories and it's so personable and like I said like you're having a lovely chat with somebody and the inclusion of these food and the um the memories he has of his parents and the food he had as a child and and now passing on those sort of like those foodie things to his children and he has lo loads of like stories from when he's been working with famous actors and when he's been on different tv jobs and stuff and and um and the recipes and stuff he's learned there and he has this amazing i loved hearing about all the time he worked in chimichangas <laughs> and yeah it was just great i just had such a good time listening to it and like david would hear me like 
absolutely cracking up over it and I said, oh, you must listen to it. And he, I've been hearing him absolutely cracking up over it, which has been really, really nice. So yes, would highly recommend if you're looking for a hoot of a book. Um, really good, really good. Uh, next up at number four, well, number four is one particular book from this series, but when uh, in May, I had an absolutely lovely day where the, the first three episodes of the new series of Bridgerton were out, maybe the first four episodes of the new series of Bridgerton. Sirens going by. Um, and I had a day off of work, oh it was a fire, fire engine, I had a day off of work and I set that day aside and I read all of the Heartstopper books, all five of them, there's the sixth uh, volume coming out later on this year, and watched the first four episodes of the new series of Bridgerton. And I alternated them, so I started with a Heartstopper, then I went on to an episode of Bridgerton, and it was just the most blissful day, and it was so lovely. And I had such a wonderful time reading those Heartstopper books. I'd read one, two, and three before, um, hadn't read four and five, and they're all astonishing. Like, amazing that there's able to get so much feeling and love and joy, but also heartache and everything through these drawings and through very minimal sort of descriptive writing and also like not that all that much sort of conversation there's like text messages and stuff like that going on but like it really does just amaze me every time i read them and four and five were amazing because four was so deep and covered some really hard mental health stuff that one of the characters charlie goes through uh, where he has to have an inpatient stay in a mental health uh, institution and there's a lot of stuff in there so trigger warnings for sort of self-harm and um, eating disorders and mental health issues um yeah it was it was really it was really hard to read but similarly really hopeful because although you it, it's not you don't read it and think oh charlie's gonna be fine by the end of this because then you're really thinking is he gonna be fine but it's so educational on like how people around people going through mental health episodes like can behave and, and what to do with yourself and how to make for example nick charlie's boyfriend feel um like how he could potentially have happy days despite his boyfriend being very unwell in hospital it was amazing and I cried literally from start to finish. It was so special. Um, the whole series is amazing, but I think book uh, volume four was just a complete standout for me that something had been tackled so sensibly and gently and really real, like it felt really, really real. So hats off to Alice Oseman. It was fantastically done. My battery's going, so I've got to change my battery now. And now we're into the top three. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, number three. Uh, of the best books that I've read so far this year is House on the Strand by Daphne du Maurier. Delighted to be able to add a Daphne du Maurier book to the best books that I've read this year because um, I'm running out of Daphne du Maurier books to read and some of the ones I've read have been <laughs> but this was really really good fun. This is The House on the Strand. Um, completely different to any sort of like Daphne du Maurier type stuff that I've read before and um, amazing really that this was written in 1969 because it reads so modernly it's about time travel um, and it's about a young chap called uh, Dick Young and he's sort of quite impressionable and he's got this professor that he's got this sort of professional but maybe like a little bit of a crush relationship on this professor called Magnus Lane who is developing some sort of potion that can um, make you time travel so when he asks dick to to take the potion dick doesn't know that it's for time travel he just tells him to take it and he sort of just does um and it wherever you are in in the uk so this all happens as most things do in cornwall in daphne du maurier books um it transforms you but it transports you back to the 14th century uh in cornwall so wherever you might be standing so for instance dick might be in like like stood by a train line or something and then when it transports you back you're like on a trade path or something or you might be in a house somewhere but when you take the in 14th century there wasn't a house there so you'd be outside and then you get to sort of like follow the characters the, the people who are living around that time and dick becomes sort of addicted to finding out what's going on with these people in the 14th century but also addicted to the potions themselves and how that makes him feel um so yeah really really clever writing in terms of like dealing with themes of addiction but also um 
the sort of gossip of looking back at these people that were living in 14th century Cornwall and then Dick finding out that Magnus has also travelled back there and then speaking to Magnus about these people and then being so sort of excited about these people that were living in those times and gossiping about them and stuff like that and some stuff, some really like weird stuff unfurls in terms of like what's happening in the present day um but yeah i thought this was great i really 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 loved it so um yeah and like i said was delighted to be able to add um another daphne de Maurier book to like my favorite books of the year so number two uh, is a book that i only finished two days ago but I, we read this for patreon book club it's pet by Catherine chidgy um and the theme for june's patreon book club was books i think we might like because as well as my reading not being like great throughout the year so far the reading that was going on in the book club we were sort of reading a lot of like two and three star books and nothing was really working greatly for us that's not to say that everybody loved or hated them like we we get a sort of quite a wide range of people in like either like enjoying books that maybe everyone hasn't loved or not enjoying books that everyone has loved but yeah so I picked a few books that I thought we would enjoy and one of them was Pet and that's the one that won and guess what we did all enjoy it so this is set in the um, 80s and uh, 1984 and in 2014 in New Zealand and you're following um, a character Justine um, who uh, has a teacher a new teacher called Mrs Price and Mrs Price sort of um, prizes um, certain students over others and treats them as her pet and gives them little jobs to do like closing the windows at the end of the day and wiping the board down and these children sort of live for this happening they're so so excited to, to be like one of mrs price's pets and um then things start going missing um in the in the in the classroom like little things which are precious to people so for example the thing that goes missing of justine's is this pen that you see on the front cover um justine's mother has died and this was a pen that justine's mother gave her so it's a very very special pen to her and she only uses it for tests and things she doesn't use it every day um and it goes missing and all of these sort of like little things go missing from these from from the from the classroom so you've got that but then you've also got this 2014 um angle where you've got Justine going to visit her dad who um is suffering from Alzheimer's in a care home and the young woman who is caring for her uh, for him really reminds her of Mrs Price and um you're sort of finding out things that are happening in modern times that maybe like and as you're finding out more of what happened in 1984 you think well that can't be true because I know this happened in 1984 it was really good, it was really tense, it was built up brilliantly. Um, and yeah, just a really good sort of like literary psychological thriller. I think this will stay with me for a really long time. And also I read Remote Sympathy by Catherine Chidgy. If it wasn't last year, it was the year before. Um, and this, like the range on that woman, <laughs> the range of writing on that woman, because that was like set in a sort of like Nazi concentration camp. Um, and yeah, to then pull off this, which is like quite a modern piece, was yeah amazing this front cover once you've read the book is something so special uh, i think this is probably my favorite front cover of all time like it's really really great like i mentioned this pen um is quite a big part in the story but yeah once you um once you've read the book the cover means so much more to you than 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 this does but yeah than just seeing it in the first place but amazing really really good would highly recommend if you're going on holiday this year and you're looking for a page turner um to read on the beach or something pick up pet by Catherine Chigi, absolutely brilliant. And then the last book, number one, like I said at the beginning of this video, this has been a bit of a surprise for me because this book is not the best written book I've read, not even, I would say it's in the bottom half of the best written books of all time, but it brought me so much joy at a time I was thinking, God, my reading just isn't really doing much for me this year. And it's the book Reach for the Stars by Michael Cragg. Uh, this is um, 1996 to 2006, fame fallout and pop's final party and it follows a decade in pop music when i was very active on the sort of pop music scene it follows um the careers of people like s club seven and take that um and atomic kitten and bands that i was really really into as well as also the shows like um pop idol and pop stars the rivals which were sort of formative bits of television for me as a young woman watching these things like i remember them all so vividly and i had such a lovely time sort of like reading a chapter of this and then going on into like a youtube hole of looking at videos of pop stars the rivals and pop idol and pop stars like everyone getting all these bands getting together and like those sort of sat i lived for those bits of saturday night tv of like 
like them the bands being formed like hearsay being formed and then the people that didn't get into hearsay when they formed the band liberty x and just me being like i can't believe this band is so good maybe having a little thought then thinking oh maybe these sort of um like Simon Cow type things aren't the best way like the people who are not winning these competitions are actually ending up doing a bit better than the people that are winning and just being amazed and mesmerized by all of that but yeah it was an absolute indulgent sort of gossip fest um and I absolutely loved it and I also loved how snarky uh, the writer was about Louis Walsh because he sounds awful <laughs> but yeah this was a really really good fun time um and I think if you like I was born in 1986 this is from like it's quite like it's a big piece of time when you think about like the decade 96 to 2006 you're like sure that's 10 years but when I think about the fact that I was 10 in 1996 and then I was a 20 <laughs> you really had to think about that there. I was 20 in 2006 so like a lot of stuff has changed in my life in that 10 years and yeah all of this I remembered all of it absolutely perfectly so a great great laugh and a great great sort of revisit to some great moments of television and pop history loved it so there we go those are my favorite eight books of the year so far like i said if you've read any of these books do let me know and please 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 let me know um what your reading's been like this year and what your favorite books of the year have been so far and i will see you all again soon for another booktube video i'll see you on sunday in fact goodbye <laughs>